Um, we, we lost to Sheffield Wednesday towards the end no, of the season. No, it was, it was before that. It was, um, I think, was it, I was coming towards, not say coming towards him in the end of my career, but Dave had brought in, obviously, Roger Johnson and Glenn Leuvens, two good young centre-halves. Um, and I think the start of my last season at Cardiff, he chose at the start of the season to play, to play them two, which was fine. That's football, you know. I was, mm. I was, <laughs> I was a lot older than them, and uh, a lot slower. And he, he, and he just took that decision. And I think as the season dragged on, there's a couple of things. I think I, he blamed me for a goal as the as the season went on, um, and he put it out in the media, and I sort of had a pop back at him in the media, which we shouldn't have done. We should have just sat down in the dressing room and. And I oh, sat down in his office and, and, and had it out and said, look, if you don't want me here, let's go. Yeah, no, this was probably the hardest thing. I, I left West Brom to come to Cardiff to, for that reason. I was I had two years left on the contract for West Brom and actually took a massive drop in wages and walked away from West Brom with pretty much nothing because I wanted to play football. Yeah. And I didn't see myself playing at West Brom at that moment in time. And as, as much as it cost me a few quid, it was probably one of the best decisions I made because I got the opportunity to come and play for so Cardiff. It's a tough one to say. I, like, I'm a Millwall fan. Mm -hmm. I've played for Birmingham for nine years and played for Cardiff for four. And if, you, if I was to look at three teams, they're probably my three main teams. One, the one that I supported, one that I've spent most of my time. It must have been uh, a bit weird at times for you to, because obviously you like, played at some massive clubs in some massive games. And then obviously at the tail end of your career, you're traveling with the fans. And you can hear him at the front of the bus, sort of. Oh, this was popped today. I never said that. No, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> Five stars every, every week. One of the things when I when I came in as twenty ones manager at the end of last year, it was one of the things that I said that the club was lax. We we'd never sent enough players out on loan, mm. um, and we never sent enough players out on loan to the right level. You know. I mean, if you looked at the 21's results as up until Christmas last year, they won every single game. But in the second half of the season, we, we sent people like Chanka Simba out, James Connolly, we sold to Bristol Rovers, because that's what was right for them as individuals. It probably wasn't right for the under-21's as a team, because we actually struggled the second half of the season because of the results we picked up. But for the four, five, six individuals that we sent out on loan, it was perfect for them, hence why. Yes, guys, I'm Sai. Welcome back to Ace Podcast Nation. Here for another episode of uh, My Story Extra. And uh, we're here at East Sleep Media again. Delighted to welcome back uh, ex Millwall, Birmingham, Sheffield Wednesday, and of course, Cardiff City. And plus, Cardiff City's under 23 coach, Darren Purse. Welcome back, my friends. Good friend. to be back, Sai. Indeed, yeah, good. I'm, I'm glad to have you back, mate, because I felt like we were just getting going last time. And then we had to, I was like, oh, we've got to go, because you had to go somewhere, I had to go somewhere. So I was keen to get you back in. But um, we'll kind of fly around a bit, I think, today, and we'll just have a little go back to different points in your career, and I'm going to hear some stories and that. The one story which I was kind of um, thinking about in the aftermath of we talking, which I wish I'd kind of asked you about, was when, um, well, it was reported in Wales Online in 2016 or 17, like where you, were, you had words with Dave Jones after the, the kind of playoff. I think we lost to Sheffield Wednesday towards the end. No, of the it, it was it was before that. It was um, I think obviously I was coming towards not say coming towards him in the end of my career, but Dave had brought in obviously Roger Johnson and Glenn Leuvens, two good young centre halves. Um, and I think the start of my last season at Cardiff, he chose at the start of the season to play to play them two, which was, was fine. That's football, you know. I was mm. I was <laughs> I was a lot older than them and uh, a lot slower, and he and he just took that decision and I think as the season dragged on there's a couple of things I think I, he blamed me for a goal as the, as the season went on um, and he put it out in the media and I sort of had a pop back at him in the media which we shouldn't have done we should have just sat down in the dressing room and and I oh, sat down in his office and, and, and had it out and said look if you don't want me here let's go so we had a sort of bit of a turn and throw in in the media which is not the right place to to have a conversation so that was that and then um yeah, and obviously in the January, I nearly signed for Norwich. I think he was trying to sign Mark, Mark Hudson at the time um, to come in from Palace, and it didn't happen. So I ended up staying around for the second half of the season. Didn't really play that much. Um, and then I think it was after the Preston result, we got, we got beat 6-0. 
and that ultimately that was the one that cost us promote uh, or cost us the playoffs. If we lost five nil, we'd have been all right. Yeah. We lost six nil. Preston pipped us by a goal um, after the last game of the season. So I think that was the result that did us. Um, and he pulled me back in, and I played the last game of the season at Sheffield Wednesday, and we needed a point to get into the playoffs. Um, and we got beat one nil. I remember Jermaine Johnson scored a worldy goal from sort of 25 yards, and we. Um, so it was a little bit. It was hard for me because obviously I knew it was my last game. I knew I was leaving, but I'm trying to get the club into the playoffs after yeah, the last few games of the season, not playing a lot for that last real. The last sort of the last I only played probably 10, 12 games in like the second or the last uh, the, the last season I was here. So from that point of view, I was disappointed because it was finishing on a bit of a low for me. Yeah. But yeah, we we had words and I spoke to him since. Like we, we, mm. he, he's someone that if I if I went into management, I'd lean on because I think he's a he's got a wealth of experience. He's a he was a great man. What he did for Cardiff over the six years he was here, you couldn't fault. I thought he was uh, he was fantastic at what he did. It's just a shame he wasn't the one to get Cardiff in the Premier League and because uh, he probably deserved it for what he did over the years. Yeah, it was just that final step under him, wasn't it? He seemed to always just get pipped on, you know, from the playoffs or just miss out on the playoffs. It was just unfortunate. But that time, like following as a fan, was um, was some of the most enjoyable times because you had play, playing awesome football. Yeah. Some unbelievable players. It sounds like there was just a bit of frustration building. Yeah, I, going I, th on. I think from from both ends. I think you know mm. from probably Dave's end and, and my end as well. But at the end, that's what we you, you, yeah. you have to you have to deal with it. You take the t take the rough and the smooth at the same time. And that was probably one of the low points in my career because I still felt that I had something to give, um, but never quite got the opportunity in that last year to to probably get a run of games. And um, and I was always one of them players that I needed to play game after game after game and it's probably only four, five, six games into that run that you probably see the best of me So from a from a fitness point of view. So I was never one of them that was going to sit around and, and wait for the opportunity because it wasn't me. Yeah, and I suppose like with your career now, it, it's like um, the latter part of your career is where football changed from maybe 11, 12, 13 players being the main core of the squad and you'd kind of have that to really be in like a you know, 16 or 18 man squad, yeah. which people rotate like week in, week out. And if you're a player who, for the first part of your career or a lot of your career, is used to, you know, just turning games over, it must be quite difficult to then be part of a rotation. Yeah, this is probably the hardest thing. I'd, I left West Brom to come to Cardiff to, for that reason. I was, I had two years left on my contract at West Brom and actually took a massive drop in wages. And walked away from West Brom with pretty much nothing because I wanted to play football yeah. and I didn't see myself playing at West Brom at that moment in time and as as much as it cost me a few quid it was probably one of the best decisions I made because I got the opportunity to come and play for Cardiff and um, and never look back over the four years that I was there I, I, I loved every minute of it so yeah I, I was I always wanted to even towards the end of my career when I was at Millwall I was sort of third choice centre half not getting on the bench on a Saturday afternoon but I knew if there was one injury, one suspension, I'd be playing. But I was frustrated with it. I wanted to play week in, week out. I was getting on, I was 35, 36 years of age and I just wanted to enjoy the last few years of my career, hence why I left there and went to, to Plymouth. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's probably something, if I look back on my, my career now compared to the game nowadays, I think it's probably the one that I would, uh, I'd look back and not regretted because I've never, I don't regret anything, but... Maybe if I have stayed around at Millwall, I would have had the opportunity to do what we did at Plymouth. And of course, yeah. Um, yeah so it's, 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 hindsight's a wonderful thing. Mm. But I, um, yeah, I that must have been difficult though as well, because obviously Millwall is an um, important club to you, isn't it? Well, um, I think if I'd have stayed at Millwall, I'd, I had an extra. I'd, I'd been offered an extra year. I didn't start the season, but I was obviously always on. So I was either on the bench or off the bench, or if there was like cup games, I'd play, and I could have maybe sort of seen my career out there, nicked another year and maybe gone into like my coaching side at 36, 37 mm. at Millwall, my boy of the club. But I still felt that I wanted to play football and I think sometimes you have to trust how you feel. Yeah. Um, I wasn't looking at the long term, I was just looking at, yeah, I, would, I just want to enjoy playing for as long as I can, hence why I dropped to, to non-league because I, I still felt that I wanted to, I wanted to carry on playing, just enjoy the last few years of my career, yeah. What about, um, so I'm going to ask you a, a tough question. It might be, I think it's tough, but maybe it won't be for you. I don't know. Obviously, so Millwall's your club, and you played, um, was four years at Cardiff. 
which clubs fans do you think creates a better app no so two questions which atmosphere is better week to week and which atmosphere is better on the you know like a big game it's a, it's a tough one to say I, like, I'm a Millwall fan mm-hmm. I've played for Birmingham for nine years and played for Cardiff for four and if you, if I was to look at three teams they're probably my three main teams one the one that I supported and one that I've spent most of my time at and i they're probably three of the best. They'd be in the top five of all the fans in the country. Yeah. Just for, obviously, noise, aggression a little bit if you want. They, they, they back their teams to the hill. If you run through brick walls for them, they'll back you. So from that point of view, all three of them were fantastic. I, I, it's, a t- I, I, it's one that I've never really answered. I yeah. don't think I could answer. You know, on, on any given day, like when I played for Birmingham, I had... The, the, one of the best atmospheres I've ever had in football was when we beat Ipswich in the semi-final World of Wormington and Cup. Mm. It was like one of the most amazing nights. It was up there one minute, down there, because we was going out, and then we nicked it in extra time. So if you was to bottle up that atmosphere, but then I remember my first my first game, at, or my first midweek game at, at Cardiff was Leeds at home, mm. you know, and we won 2-1. And you, you bottle that atmosphere from Ninian yeah. Park up, and you think, wow. So, yeah, it's tough. and. I've been in the away end and watched Millwall home and away at a few places as well, and actually been in the thick of it as a fan. So I don't think you can. I don't think you can compare that. They're, they're all different. They've all got their plus points, all got their minus points. But I think for me, looking back on my career, I feel privileged to have played for probably three out of the best top five fans in probably in in in, in the country. It's a good answer, that, isn't it? Off the top of your head as well. I think that's a good answer. But um, no, I, I tend to agree. Obviously, I haven't experienced... Uh, I, went to, I think I went to Millwall away once. Yeah. It wasn't... I wouldn't say it was a fun, I, I fun, did, it wasn't a fun time. I did Millwall time. away with um, with Birmingham in the playoffs. Playoff semi-final. We needed to go... I think we drew at home and we needed to go away from home and, and beat Millwall for Birmingham. And that was a tough one. I've got all my family of all Millwall fans in the, in the stands. Obviously, I'm there. I think they all wanted me to, to, to win the game it was the opportunity to get promoted to the Premier League but that was the night where we never left the stadium until about 2 o'clock in the morning all the Millwall fans had sort of barricaded us into the stadium <laughs> they wouldn't let us out it was, um, it, was a, it was a mad night but obviously a fun night because obviously we ended up winning it and getting to the playoff final we beat Norwich in the final so it worked out well but that was an unbelievable atmosphere but then I'm assuming the nights like those they're special nights and they when you look back on your playing career those are the nights which you remember fondly and, and just do you know what I mean like those types of um, like the big events the special days no, yeah, things I, like that I think, think it's mad you look back at I look at other sports as well so if I, like the Wimbledon final and when you've got a ma- when you've got sort of say like Novak Djokovic serving for this like to win the, the, the win the men's singles at Wimbledon you think the pressure that he's on to to actually just to actually get the ball over the net with yeah. that much pressure on you is mad. But then I also look back on my my playing career and you play in front of 80,000, 90,000 people and you think, well, how could you do your job when there's that pressure on you and that, and that many fans on you? I think you just you try and put yourself into that zone every time and the more you do it, the more you can appreciate it, the, more you, the, the, the better you can perform when you're put under that pressure. So it's mad when you do train for something and you do do it on a daily basis that... You just naturally just just get used to the pressure and, and what it's like to yeah, yeah. to do it on a daily basis. I always wondered, like, so you know, like well, football fans, all football fans are quite fickle in some ways in terms of like, like you just said there, it's like the ups and the downs of the game, and if someone makes a mistake, it's like a groan, and 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 sometimes fans can be quite vocal. They say, "Oh, come on, so and so, you this." Can you hear individual, like people? when you're taking a throw in or whatever and they're shouting stuff at you? No. When, 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 when it, it, it's strange and something I've dropped because obviously drop into non-league football when I fin- like finish playing, you hear more when there's 400, 500 watching you than you do when there's 30, 40, 50,000 watching you. It's crazy though, It's mad. It? Like, I think sometimes when, you, when you've got that many fans around, you just tend to zone out, you're concentrating on the game, you don't really sort of, you don't really notice what's around. Mm. I know it, 
at it's time. More of a general noise, I suppose. Yeah, it is. It? A, yeah, a bit more of a general noise. You know when the fans are sort of are backing your team. You know when you're on top in the game, you can hear them backing you. You know when you're not on top, you're really under pressure, and there you can hear their frustration. So you can hear that, but you can't hear general, yeah, general things. But when dropping to non-league football, you can hear everything. <laughs> and purse you fat, everything <laughs> like that, <laughs> and just. Some of the names. Why are you still playing? <laughs> Should mm-hmm. be getting your pension. All that sort of stuff. You, you hear everything because there's not that many. Uh, there's not that many fans. It's like little little things like play. And I think I played in a semi- cup, like a playoff semi final for Chesham against Stourbridge. And this this fella came up to like on the side of the pitch. He's like, "Oi, Purse, you scum! You've called my daughter or something or other." I looked at him. I went, "I haven't said anything to you. I don't know who your daughter is." <laughs> what? So he's going, I'll see you after in the in the bar. I went, no worries, mate. So after the game, I went looking for him in the bar. Yeah, and I went up to him and I said, what are you on? What if I called your daughter in the bar afterwards? He went, oh, no, well, you were someone else. I went, what are you having a pop at me for then? <laughs> Idiot. You know, just uh, little things like that, just random. Then from From non-league football, the, the, the randomness yeah. of it. So I like it, it was good. I, I enjoyed it. So dropping down to non-league, it was... Uh, it was enjoyable sort of four years at the end of your career. Yeah, I like I, I do like that. Is that the <coughs> I went and watched a couple of Tapswell games during the uh the rebrand and stuff and that it was just it's just a different it's the same but different if that makes sense. Like it's still football, isn't it? But it's just it's much more as a fan, like it's, you feel so much part of like I know a few of the boys who follow like Tapswell, they'll follow them or Kyle yeah. Met, they'll follow them everywhere. Yeah. And uh, they just, but they they all know the players, and they they kind of they feel more. It's more of a family, them, yeah. Because you know, you you end up where sort of the the players and the fans end up travelling on the same coach as well. So you'll have the same sort of twenty thirty players, players. Oh, sorry, the same twenty thirty supporters on the coach travelling to an away game with you. So after the game, you've got them. You can hear a murmuring up mm-hmm. the front. This was good. This was crap. All that sort of stuff. But ultimately. There's a massive turnover of players usually in non-league, and all you can say about the fans is is just that they love the football club that they support. Yeah. They're they're just as passionate as the Cardiff fans, the Birmingham fans, the Millwall fans, Plymouth fans. You look at the Plymouth fans, the amount they travel. The, the, the non-league fans do exactly that, but for I don't know if it's less enjoyment, but less of the prestige than what the, yeah. the league clubs do. But they still they still got the same passion for the football club and, and they do it they do anything for the for the club to keep it afloat. Yeah, hundred percent. It's like community spirit. Yeah, that's it. It's huge. It's um it's funny though. Like it must have been a bit weird at times for you to because obviously you like you've played at some massive clubs in some massive games and then obviously at the tail end of your career you're travelling with the fans and you can hear them at the front of the bus sort of. Oh, Pierce was crap today, wasn't you? I never said that. In well, that was course, what? <laughs> five stars every, every week, wasn't it? But it's got to be a bit of a strange experience. But then it's still football, isn't it? No, it's, 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 it's still football, and um, yeah, I, I just I thank you for giving me the the opportunity to carry on playing and, and enjoying me football. And there's some there's some real gems as well in mm-hmm. non-league football. I think you look down. We've got one at, at Cardiff that we signed, Oli Tanner. You know, he's come from Lewis. He's a young lad trying to make his way in the game. He's got he's got great talent, um, and sometimes there's usually something missing to why they're playing non-league football, to why they're to why they're not playing league football. And it might be a great player, just that lack that attitude or that that desire. Sometimes, you know, and so there's some lads in non-league football got the attitude, desire, just haven't got it technically. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's always something missing between the boys that are down there. But there is some talent, and uh, and they make the best of what they've got. Is there many? Down in the in the various connotations of the, like the non-league and all that, Jack. And there's many players in there who've who've like just been missed out because there's you know the vast majority of kids want to be footballers. So there's a lot of kids for clubs to try and scoop up into academies and stuff. I think there's a few down there who are you know good enough, got the right attitude, everything, but they've just missed loads. Loads. I think I think that's the probably the the beauty of I think 21s, 23s football now is. I think you can give them lads that miss out 18 years of age from getting a professional contract. They drop down to non-league, whether or not that's sort of Conference South or even like the Welsh Prem. You look at some of the boys that have been released from Cardiff, gone to a Welsh Prem club, and now they've ended up making a career and end up at Newport and places like that. So there's there's, there's opportunities if, if players do it right that at 18, 19, when they are released, there's still, there still is that way back into professional football. Maybe yeah. not in the Premier League or the Championship where they think they should be, 
but at League One, League Two level where they, they realistically are, yeah. oh, that's where they're at. So there's, there's opportunities out there for their fun. And I think sometimes um, you've got to take you two steps back to go forward. Do you know? So, and like I had um, a sports psychologist on before and she her job was to work with players who have kind of been in the academy system, you know, like from 10. And then when they come, when it's come to decision time, for whatever reason, they've been dropped out of the system. And her job is to basically work with them and try and, you know, help them decide if they're going to try and get a club in non-league mm-hmm. or if they're going to go elsewhere, you know, yeah. drop out. Make another career. Yeah. yeah. There's the, the thing with uh, our find is with them lads that get released at 18, I think they've been in the academy system from 8 to 18. That's 10 years of their life that they've been involved in it. And they take it for granted sometimes. You know, they think, oh, yeah, everything's fine. I'll get a professional contract. It's all be good. The just, yeah, I've gone from 15s to 16s. I've gone 16s to 18s. I've had me two years. I've played every game for the under-18s. But what they don't realise, and it, sometimes it takes them to be released, it takes that disappointment for them to actually go away from it, rethink and go, do you know what? I didn't grasp that opportunity. Hopefully I'll get another one. And they're better prepared for it. And uh, they sort of sleepwalk into, into getting released at 18, 19 years of age. And I think that's the that's the, the the tough thing you try to instill into into the lads, especially for me within the twenty ones that I do. You look at the player, who do the players that you le- you played with last year? Are they still here this year? No. Why? Why was the re- why did they get released? What's the reason they're not here anymore? Mm. Well, don't let that be you in a year's time. You know, and there's play- Some players will grasp it. Some players won't. Yeah. Players that grasp it end up making a career out of it. The players that don't grasp it have to drop back out. And if they if they get the bit between their teeth and they go and try to crack on again, then the opportunity is there for it. If they don't and they still think they're the world's best player and and don't look at themselves and the reasons why they got released, then they'll end up playing non-league football for the rest of their career. So, yeah. But I think sometimes there, there is that they need to have that extra dimension to one part of their game. They need to be an athlete or they need to be a te- technically top draw player. Or they need to have an actual where they run through brick walls for, for for the manager and for the club. Invariably, if you've got one, two, all three of them, that will help you out to, to, to make the, the best of your career in, in football. You know, with the 23 system as it is now, are you able to bring in players like uh, for trials from non-league clubs, or do they have to go through the club as a whole and stuff like that? No, no, we we we're, we're open to to bring in anywhere we get we get hundreds of emails a week from, okay. from lads around the country from abroad um, oh, I'd love to come I'm, I'm perfect for your football club ultimately the, the, out of the hundred emails we get there's probably one of them that is perfect yeah. but it's trying to sift through the ones that are not trying to get the right ones in to, for trial so you can actually get eyes on them and look at them because you're not you're not looking at, at like we said you know you're not looking at how good they are as a footballer. You're looking at them as a person. Are they the right person for for the football club? Do they treat the badge with the respect that it should be treated with? You know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of other things that goes to to making it as a professional footballer. It's not it's not always the best player or like the the top one percent that of players that make it. Sometimes you need a bit of everything within mm. that. It must be hard for people like yourself and the other guys who make those decisions. Because it's difficult now if you see someone who's, you know, a phenomenal player, your first thought is that's a phenomenal footballer, isn't it? Yeah. But then you might when you delve into it a bit deeper you might find out, you know, they got a bit of a bad attitude or, you know, whatever it may be. And then how difficult is it to weigh up that because like you just said, you name sort of five different things at least which you've got to kinda of look at yeah. as an overall picture. I think as 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 managers and the managers will sort of say, I mean when you when you put a player into your starting eleven or into your team, you need to know that you're trusting that player. And I think if you've got that trust with a player, I think that's what helps you develop them. And I think if you can't trust a player, I think that's when it all, the the relationship ultimately breaks down between a player and a manager. Mm-hmm. There needs to be that trust between both parties. The player needs to trust you that you've got his best interest at, at heart, and the and the, and the the manager needs to trust the player that when he goes on to that onto that pitch every week he's going to give his best you know exactly what you're going to get from him um, so I think that, that there is that trust between the, that that needs to be there so a lot of a big part of trust is communication isn't it hmm? so 
general question, and I'm not. It's not about anyone in particular, but like, so going back through your career, there'll be a footballers from all different countries, and then because th- there's the way of the world now, it's so easy to travel. Um, is it more difficult for a player, say, who comes from Spain or Portugal or wherever, and maybe their English is a bit broken or whatever, to build that trust with a with a new manager, with a dressing room, with the teammates? Uh, well, I think oh, I mean, that comes down to the manager. If he's signing a player or bringing a player for, over from Spain, he must have uh, a knowledge of the player. He must trust the player that he's bringing in to to be maybe the missing link that he needs. Mm. You know, if it's, if he doesn't or he, or he brings him in and it doesn't work out, the manager's got to look at himself and say, well, why didn't it work out? Is it is it because of me? Is it because of the player's attitude? Did, have, did I make a wrong judgment call on the player from from whatever reason? Whether not from a technical point of view was he not quite the player that we needed to fit into that into that role you know did the player did the player give himself the best opportunity to settle into the country settle into the club and and, and play the best that he can play it, there will always be a number of factors why it hasn't worked out um, but there needs to be someone there whether that's the manager or the player that looks at it and goes I could have done a little bit more there I yeah. could have found out about the player a little bit more. Could have found out about his family and asked him a few more questions. Could I have made him feel at home a little bit more? There's always going to be a number of questions that, as a as a as a manager, as a person, you you look at and think I could have done better on that in that situation. As long as you learn from it, then it gives you it gives you better grounding as you go forwards. If you don't learn from it, you will continue making the same mistakes. Yes, hundred percent. The um, in the first uh, first one we did, you talked a little bit about the the chef of Wednesday dressing room and it being a bit of a rough place. Yep. Like, when you look back on your career, do the, a lot of the dre- dressing rooms, I'm assuming, I know dressing rooms these days are probably different to what they were when your career first started. Was the dressing room kind of mentality, making sure that you know everyone felt part of the team and stuff like that, was that generally managed by the players, by the captain, by the senior players? Or was the manager be a big part of that? Wherever I was captain, I tried to make that my part of my role was to make the the players, the families. I think the st- the, the start of every preseason or the end of every preseason, I'd always try and do a night out for the players, the wives. Um, try and get some sort of barbecue as well for maybe a Sunday before the season started, so that the players' wives, their kids could come together, so that when they all came to the game, all the wives yeah. and the kids all knew each other trying to get a crash sorted for games. That was one of my biggest things at Cardiff was trying to get a crash sorted for the game. So you can actually, if the kids wanted to, start, especially the young kids, they could stay in with the nannies or the, the people to look after them. And then you've got the wives and the older kids can actually go out and watch the game and enjoy the game. So little bits like that always helped. I think at Cardiff, it was probably one of the ones where I got it right as captain was, we had a great blend on the pitch, but off the pitch, we had a really good blend as well with, with the way that, um, the way that obviously the, the, the players, the wives and, and everybody sort of mingled, socialised. I think it helped because Cardiff's sort of out on a limb a little bit. You know, it's not like London where you've got yeah. four or five different clubs or ten clubs within the vicinity and they can mix. I think we sort of kept it in-house and we we sort of, yeah, we socialised together, which was a, a massive part. And it helped the bond between the players that we had as well because... I know it's not, but, but most Saturday nights we'd be going out for a meal together, or we'd be going out on a on a night out if we didn't have a Tuesday night game, and it just helped the bond between yeah. the players. Just builds that spirit, doesn't it? Yeah, and the team spirit. Did you, you ever get any uh, players who would push back? Not necessarily at Cardiff, but anywhere where they would kind of push back a little bit with that, and they didn't want to be part of the group away from the football. Yeah, definitely. Um, you had, you had players that didn't have wives and girlfriends. You know, you had players that were single and. And didn't want to, didn't want to grasp on, uh, and didn't want to sort of buy into what you, you're trying to create. You know, it's, it's like at Plymouth, we had sort of four or five experienced players, but a lot of youngsters. But the biggest thing, the youngsters bought into what we were saying, what we were trying to say to them. Hence, why you had people like Curtis Nelson was there as a young lad, Connor Hurahane, you know, people like that that have actually gone on and made really good careers for themselves because they bought into what you were saying. They actually listen to what he was as experienced pros, and hence why they've gone on at decent, great players ability wise. Yeah. But they actually bought into what it was like to, to be a professional footballer, and, uh, and 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 they've had good careers from that. Yeah, I like it. I think, um, like at the end of the day, 
if you're not going to listen to the people who've been there and done it, then you nine times out of ten you're going to miss out on something, aren't you? Because you, you think how much experience you've got and how much experience other you know pros who've had a similar career in terms of length and longevity. If you're not going to listen to those players as a young footballer, it's kind of like what are you doing? I, th- I think it's huge. I remember being obviously when I was 17, 18 playing with people like Glenn Cockrell who had a really good career at Southampton, you know, and Craig Bell, sorry, Craig Bellamy, uh, Gary Bellamy who was like at Wolves and he was, he was I played alongside him as a centre half. So I was like a sponge at 17 years of age trying to learn off these boys. Listen, there was some aspects that I looked at and I and I didn't really buy into that like they was that they did drink a lot. Yeah. You know, yeah, but yeah. that was it was how they relaxed it was how they how they got about it the game's changed massively different, where different world where the, 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 the lads now are they're, they're athletes they can't go out and drink no. on a Tuesday night whereas years like 20, 30 years ago you could the game was a lot slower it wasn't as professional as what it is but there is other ways you can do it like go and have a game of golf go and play if, you, if the single boys go and have a game of bowling or go to the cinema together you're still getting that bonding you're still speaking to each other spending time away from it and I think when you're on the pitch and and the the, the tough moments come if you're there and you're together in your unit and a group you, you tend to come through them in the right way rather than the wrong way yeah it's interesting isn't it like, because obviously back in the day it was like you I would, I would imagine from people I spoke to and what I've read and stuff it was very much like you'd play the game and then kind of go out and have a few beers and that was the way yeah. the teams bonded and got together and stuff and obviously there's many a famous case of players doing it and coming in Hanover and training and all that sort of stuff and then sports science come in I yep. suppose and then you had someone measuring your body fat when you came back to pre-season was that a big change you remember when that came in um yeah probably when I was I'd go to say early 30s it really started to come in we'd have a fitness coach but would never really get on to like, everybody knew like to eat your carbohydrates before a game, you know. After the game, you actually get your protein inside you to get your recovery. So everybody knew that. And as I was coming as a young boy, as a young lad coming through, I knew what it was like to look after myself, what was wrong, what was bad for you. But not like now where obviously players get blood tested, they get tested for everything. They make sure their body fat's pretty much fine every day. There's so many tests they have to do every day. So... And they'll come in after a game and do a and do a test, and if, and if they're if they're off their targets, they don't train because that that's when they're becoming in that red zone that people talk about, and mm. and, and and they've got a chance of being injured. You okay. know, whether or not that's the right way or not, because I'm sure during my career I was in the red zone or the, mm. the so-called red zone mo- a lot of the time, but never really got injured. Yeah. So it, it it's tough. I think I think we do overprotect them a little bit, but I think. The game is so fast nowadays that you do tend to end up with a, with more muscle injuries, more sort of impact injuries because the game is so quick. Do you think, um, like a 17, 18 year old Dan Purse in today's game, do you think you'd still have no. a similar career? No. I, I, wasn't, I, I just wasn't athletic enough. Okay. You know, I'd, I'd, if, if you, you think had, like, other things to your game. No, well, I'm just, I, but yeah, I, 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 I look at me now compared to a, like a, an 18 year old now. I talk a lot more than what they do. Mm. You know that would that would help me my positioning and, my, and where I was in, on the pitch and how I read the game was was key to me as a as a footballer. But as an athlete, I was never athletic enough. As a as a as a, as a 17 year old, I was supposed to be quite quick but I just think as I developed I got a bit bigger as a as you do as a centre half just got a little bit slower and I just don't think I was quite quite athletic enough. I think I'd have had a career but I don't think I've maybe reached the heights that I, I did yeah. Yeah. honest that is I suppose no, 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 no. I think I look at some of the, the boys we've got in our 23s and technically million times better player than I ever mm-hmm. was but as you said I probably had other other strings to my bow that, 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 that I haven't got hence why I probably had a career for as long as I did but yeah I probably, I probably wouldn't, have, uh, wouldn't have lasted as long as I did um, so this is a bit of a weird question because obviously you're the under 23's manager I'm not trying to put you in an old position whatsoever but I'm do you oh, think the no, game for, well, yeah, the, <laughs> do you think the, the, the kind of reserve system if you like 
was better uh, when you had like the Pontins League and it was like um, it might be called something else but you had competitive games all the time and it was literally the players who weren't in the first team squad and the best of the youth yeah. and do you think it was better like that or do you think it's better the way it is now uh, I think it was better because me as an 18 year old lad could be playing against um, like someone that's played 300 games you know, and I'm stepping into that reserve game on a Wednesday afternoon and playing there against someone and you get just get different different problems to solve. Yeah. You know, you make a mistake, don't make the same mistake again. If I got sucked in too too hard, I missed a header, how do I go and no, I don't miss that header again next time? And then back into you had to do different things, if you're treading on your toes, if you're getting elbows in your face. Whereas I don't think in twenty ones football or twenty threes you don't really get that it's yeah. that, it's, you, know, you don't get that competitive uh, it's not as competitive for what it needs to be but then on the other on from the other side I think in 21 to 23 you do get like in possession stuff like rotations teaching the boys how to just like the Christmas they're passing making sure their ball speed's right technically they're a lot more advanced as footballers mm -hmm. as what they as what they were as what we were as 17 year olds but they just lack that competitive edge and, and playing against seasoned pros I think that's the the biggest difference and I think you learn more that's hence why we try and send boys out on loan they'll learn more from a six month loan spell playing as high up the pyramid as they can and they will for playing for six months as a as just a, to get his kids in football yeah. Like, yeah I can definitely see that I think uh, the loan system like people moan about it don't they and say oh everyone's got 20 players out on loan but actually the loan system is vital now, isn't it, to the to the young footballers, because without it, like you say, you've got the twenty threes. But if you haven't got the the loan system as open and as good as it is, and as you know, you can pretty much find a football club for uh, for good players, yeah. can you? Um, it's without that, you lack that. I think it was one of the things when I when I came in as twenty ones manager uh, at the end of last year. Is one of the things that I said that the club lacks. We we'd never sent enough players out on loan, mm. um, and we never sent enough players out on loan to the right level. You know, I mean, if you looked at the twenty ones results as up until Christmas last year, they won every single game. But in the second half of the season, we we sent people like Chanka Simba out, James Connolly, we sold to Bristol Rovers, because that's what was right for them as individuals. It probably wasn't right for the under twenty ones as a team because we actually struggled the second half of the season because of the results we picked up. But for the four, five, six individuals that we sent out on loan, it was perfect for them. Hence why Chank is now at Newport County and scoring goals. James Connolly we sold in the summer to Bristol Rovers, who he went out on loan to. So you have to you have to grasp and we'd love to win every game as an under twenty ones. You know, that's that, that that would be brilliant. Now let's go and see if we can win the Premier League too. Let's see if we can get in the playoffs, go and go and win it. But we won't get judged on winning that. It'd be great to have, it's a great little string to your bow but we'll get judged on the number of players we get in the first team number of players that go and make careers for themselves over over the next five ten years and that's what that's what i see my job and my role is is to do that on a, on a, on a daily basis every day we're out on the pitch is trying to develop them players giving them the skills that they're not going to be the one that makes a debut they're going to be the one that goes and plays 500 games okay what sort of manager are you with the boys like you um quite abrasive you're quite welcoming you've um, got a bit of a hair dryer in abrasive, you abrasive sarcastic, sarcastic mm -hmm. but I've also got a love inside to me as well mm. you know I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite harsh with some lads because I think they need it I mean there's there's some lads that are in the group that that um, that need to grow up that they, they need to that they yeah they need to be told that they're, what they're doing is not good enough they need to they need to have that and I'll, I'll, I'll be on at them and I'm on at them every day if the standards are not met that's how, that, that, that's how, I, that's how I am but there's also lads in there that that, that, that have got their, their troubles and they've got their so there are lads that you have to put your arm around there are lads you can't shout and scream mm -hmm. at because they don't react to it or, the, or, or you could be harming them by doing that so I think having the personal relationship with the boys I'm not there to be their friends I'm there to help them make a career in the game but on the other hand, and I say to them every day, I love working with them, I love them as young men, and I'll give them everything that I can to try and help them 
be where they want to be, whether mm. that's playing in the Premier League or playing in League Two, mm. whatever whatever standard they're going to play at, whatever level. I want to try and give them the tools that, that that make the best for their for them as individuals. And I suppose you've got sixteen or eighteen. Got fourteen in a minute, mate. Four, right, Come 40 on, young <laughs> men who like are still finding themselves as human beings as well, aren't they? Oh, know? I just, they don't and they're know. like, um, yeah. some of them might re- respond to this, some of them might respond to that. You just don't know, you and it, it's managing those personalities, but whilst also keeping the the levels high, I guess. And yeah, the, the, the the big one as well is managing the personalities within the group as well. Mm. Uh, we've had we've had a couple of lads that are sort of the real ones that. Every half time, they're the ones that are coming in, throwing their bottles on the floor, whinging at a few of the other boys in, in mm-hmm. the dressing room. And I'm like, just calm yourself down. Think about what you're doing. Don't get involved in other people and say, but also say it in the right way. Yeah. Don't say that it's your crap and say, could you have done this better? So it's, there's a way to say it as well so that you actually get the person you're speaking to to think about what they've done or the mistake that they've made rather than chastising them for yeah. it and, 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 and actually putting them in a really bad place going out for the second half for the next game and they're on edge so, and, yeah, they're, yeah. So, and, I, and what you've said there is, is, is a big one is if you're if you're encouraging the team to go and play be expansive be good in, in the ball try and break lines with passes um, be patient build up play when they do make a mistake and they do give the ball away in the wrong area you can't hammer them for it you've got to say you've got to say to them that do it again but when you do it again was it the right pass you played the last time so you actually question about every mistake or every every pass that they make they're actually questioning it was it the right pass was there a better pass on so they're actually thinking about their game rather than just going through the motions with it all. Yeah. do they do they rewatch every game um, this is another thing about the professionalism some do some don't okay so you um, wouldn't have them in as a like a group. We I, I, I'll do we we prefer more from that we do a post match or a pre, uh, and a pre match. So we do a pre match analysis. We'll watch the team we're playing against. We'll give them the pictures of what they're like, the, some of the patterns that come out of it. We'll go out and do that on a on a on a match day minus one or a match day minus two. So they 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 know the shape we're playing against. They know pretty much the personnel we're playing against. What they're good at. What they're not so good at. Um, and then after a game, we'll reevaluate what did we do well, show them some good bits. What didn't we do so well? What can we learn from? We'll show them some bad bits. So it's about just trying to pick out the little bits of information that mm. each player needs and as a team or a unit they need as well. I find it fascinating, see, because um, obviously back in the day you had like the YTS and everything and you were doing the chores around the ground and all the, you know, all the rest of it which came with it. It's very, very different in that to the 18, 19 year olds which come into the game now it's a, like it, fe- it feels like a completely different world uh, where it was I think it's I think the the lads that come through I think if they do their if they did jobs like what we used to call it as a YTS mm-hmm. I think they're a lot more grounded with them when they go a little bit higher up mm-hmm. I think now lads uh, at 16, 17 years of age I think some of the boys think they've made it when they haven't you know, even at 19, 20 years of age, playing for the 21s, they think they've made it. And we go back to what I said earlier, they're happy just being where they are rather than having that drive and that determination to go and be better. And I say that if, if, you're, if you're 20 years of age and you're playing in 21s football, you de- unless you're a late developer, you really need to start looking over your shoulder and thinking, am I at the right place? what is my level going to be when I'm 21 years of age because you can't play 21s football forever and I think sometimes they just they just rest on I'm happy doing what I'm doing rather than sh- pushing themselves forward to, to be mm-hmm. better but I guess from a player's point of view it must be difficult if you've been in there since like under 8 under 9s which a lot of boys are haven't they and they just yeah. go through each year you almost feel like well, in 10s next year under 9s and, and you uh, end up you know, and all the way up so when you get to the 23s, if you've been through all the age groups or the majority of the age groups, it must almost feel like the well, first team next. But if you don't have that mentality to to push on from it, the players who are in the 17s, 18s will come in the following year and overtake I, I think what, what players don't realise is, and try to explain, at 16 years of age, you're the best under 16. You know, at 18 years of age, you're the best under 18. 
once you get to 19, 20, you're not the be- you're not the best player because you've got a 28 year old you're playing up against, mm. and they don't realise that. They look at the players that they're playing with within their group and they think, I'm the best player in here. No, I'm, not, I'm the best midfielder in this group. But what they don't realise is 91 other football clubs that are around there yeah. that have got midfielders that are thinking exactly the same, and they're in the big bad world of uh, of football. And it's it's that I, I think that step that step up from from probably I'd say from 16 into 18s football and into, into 21s up to the first team is the biggest step ever because there, there's so much you've got to learn in a short space of time that from 10s, 11s, 12 you can have you can be someone that's got potential yeah. 13, 14, 15 oh there he's got potential look at the size of 6 foot 1 mm. give him another year give, but only once you get to 18, under 18s level you might not get that over it, that, that extra year because mm. that's when it becomes that becomes, enough, you know? that becomes that's when it becomes a job, not a hobby. That's when it becomes that's when you you're up against not only kids that are in your age group and in your football club, you're up against kids from all over the country that are being released from Cup One football clubs, from 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 clubs all over the place. That it's a, it's a, there's a massive pool of players to choose from. Yeah, it's, I I could uh, I could talk about the ins and outs of it because I I do find it really interesting. Um, those jobs which we were talking about like as a YTS they shaped you people like yourself and you know other players from when they were still doing those things they shaped you as a young man Mm. and they made you like you said they make you grounded do the players these days do anything like that? No I I think it's something and I'm not saying like we'd sweep the stands on a Monday morning or Sunday morning after a game with like during pre-season we'd be painting the turnstiles and things like that I don't agree with that because you can call it slave labour, call it what you, we did it because that's what it, that's what it was. That's what oh, that's how much we wanted to be professional footballers. I think things like doing the first team players' boots, I think, is a huge thing because I think it gives the the the, the players a it gives them a relationship with a, with a professional, um, but it also they've actually got to go and earn the right to have somebody else to do their boots. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying yeah, by yeah, that? I do, yeah. Like when when I was a when I was a, a YTS and I was quite lucky. I only I only did it for a short space of time, but I'd pick up the you'd pick up the sweaty jockeys, you'd chuck them in the skip down, take them down to the laundry. But you did it, and you thought, do you know what? In six months' time, a year's time, somebody else is going to be doing that for me. Mm. I'm going to work so hard because that's just like the the icing on the cake of being a professional footballer. Yeah. And I think sometimes. Nowadays, they don't that the, the young players coming through don't realise how hard you've got to work to to be uh, and how hard it's going to how hard it is to to be a professional footballer. Do they um so do players these days like young footballers now they have to clean their own boots and stuff like that? Invariably, we, we, obviously we've got kit men to do it. Yeah. But I think when you talk about cleaning your boots, years ago you'd be in the boot room with a boot and polish yeah, and. and Players don't wear black boots anymore, do yeah, they? Nice. Basically, just chuck them under a shower, jump down there, clean. They're, you know what I mean? It's not. Mm. It's not like what it used to be. Yeah. At the end of a training session, we'll come out and they'll just shower Close their boots off and they're done. Yeah. So it's not really that much of a big thing. But I just think sometimes it just gives the players, and it would be harder, Carl, if we probably couldn't do it because our under 18s and our first team are on different different venues, mm. you know, different different campuses. So it would be hard to implement it. But I think it's something that I, th- I think it, it it won't go amiss from from yeah. being involved. It gives the players that little bit of responsibility for something, and I think it also gives you gives the young players a relationship with a, with one of the pros that they can ask questions. Am I doing this right? If they're in the gym together, it just gives them that little bit of a personal relationship where they can because posi- you'd usually do it position specific. So you'd put a centre central defender with a central defender centre forward of a centre forward goalkeepers do the goalkeepers so there's that relationship as you're going forward do you think if you tried to bring that in not just at Cardiff if any club tried to bring that back there would be any pushback um, I'm sure the there will game. be um, the pushback would come from the players that get released but the, 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 that's it, the pushback would come the, the, that's like the parents that, no, that's yeah, like the parents, parents, and parents the agents and that <laughs> the pushback would come why are you making my son clean the boots mm. you know I, I don't think he will ever come back in. 
is is football lesser for it? Yeah. But I'm just thinking from me as a as a person from a, as a personal point of view. I just think it, it, it I think it's a good thing. It gives you it gives you grounding and it gives you it gives you like some personal responsibility and a, and a relationship with the the, the players that you're that are aspiring aspiring to be. Mm. Do um do any of the twenty threes would they ask to go out on loan or do they wait for you to say? Um, yeah, that, that we have conversations with. with I, I have conversations with players all the time, and there's players that it's right for. There's players that it's not right for. Mm. There'd be players in in the twenty threes that that all want to go out on loan and think it's the right move for them, but I I won't. You know, and I'll, I'll have that conversation with myself. We'll have the conversation with the manager. We'll. Yeah, we, we, it's all about that communication and doing what's right for each player. Ultimately, over 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 a course of a season or a couple of seasons if you've got a first year pro second year pro over that course of two seasons they should be out on loan for probably six months what hurts Cardiff is we have to send players out for six months so we'll send the player out at the end of the August transfer window and they can't come back to us till January the same in January they can go until the end of the season but they can't come back if you're going England to England clubs you can send them out for a month so you could send you could send a young lad out for a month to a conference south club, a conference club, watch him for a month. He'll come back in, and you think, do you know what? He's done really well there. Let's go and step him up to the next level. So they could actually have three loan moves over the course of six months, where he's gone conference south, conference maybe even le- in, into League Two over six months. Whereas we have to send our players out to conference south, and they've got to be there for six months. Come back, and they have to go out for another six months, maybe to the next level. Yeah. So it's it, hurt, it, hurt, it hurts well. us as a yeah. football club, but we need to do it. The boys need to come play in their course. The, 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 the immense football. Because I suppose there's the other side of it is if they go wherever, if so, if a player goes to you know club X, and they come back, or they or they get there and they're there for a few weeks, they might be homesick. Yeah. They could be struggling. They might not settle. They might not don't work. get on with a manager that yeah, they're playing for. Whatever, there's loads of it? stuff that goes on. We've, we've had it. Well, since I've been at the club, we've had it with, with players. It's it's hard, and that's why picking the right loan move, picking the right pl- the right club for the right player, is key. We've got it wrong. We've also got it right. So, mm. with um, yeah, sometimes you have to, as as managers, as as people that are involved with these uh, of these players' careers, you have to sort of you have to make sure that the decisions you make, you get more right than you get wrong. Um, I wanted to circle back a bit, um, just as we sort of start to wrap up a bit, but um. When you were talking about like playing in the non-league yourself and stuff, um, I was gonna ask you like got distracted by asking you something else. But um, when did you know you were done? Like when did you know I'm done? I'm retiring. Um, or was it a case of just jobs came up in coaching? I didn't. Um, I didn't know I was done professionally. It was, it was sort of it was forced upon me, not from a personal point of view, rather than from a from a professional point of view. Mm. I don't want to go too much more into yeah. that, but I, I think. Yeah, I, I had, I had basically I had to put my kids before my career. If okay. you know what I mean. So I, I, it was when I was thirty-seven. I, I still had the opportunity to stay in professional football if I wanted to, but I had to put my kids before my my, yeah. my career, and it probably set my coaching career back four or five years. Okay, but it was a decision that I had that I made that I was happy to make, and probably the, one of the better decisions that I made in in my lifetime. If you know what I mean. Are you enjoying coaching? Like as you've progressed and, and I, I, I yeah, I enjoy I enjoy the management side of it a million yeah. times more than I do the coaching. I enjoy being out on the pitch, I enjoy having a bit of banter with the lads, I enjoy seeing the work you put in on for, on a daily basis come out in games. I enjoy seeing the, the the lads learning from the mistakes they make, learning from the information that you give them. I th- I think that's probably the, the biggest part of the uh, of the of of where I am at this moment in time, I, I really enjoy that. Um, yeah, so I, I, I just I'm, I'm really I just love the the job that I'm in. I love where I'm living at the moment. I'm just in a really good place in, in life at this moment. This card is awesome. Man. I, I, I love it. It's amazing. So, <coughs> ultimately, with your managerial career, do you think you're like well, not do you think? Would you rather keep working with like twenty threes and and young players? Would you like to go and be a first team manager somewhere eventually? I, 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 that's where I want to be. 
Mm-hmm. Whether I get that opportunity or not, I don't know. We're, we're, the only time will tell. Um, I'm not ready for it anywhere near. I'm learning so much every day from from the amount of like Morrow's brilliant. And you look at obviously where where we are as as as, as coaches. I, I think I'm older than Morrow, but I think he's got more experience from me from a coaching point of view. Finished playing a lot, a lot younger than what I did. Um, I think he's a, he's an ec- an excellent manager. The way he goes around, the way he's going around things at the moment. I think the way he's handled the the turnover of players over the summer. Um, I think the club's in a good place in his hands. So learning from him every day. People at Huds that are around there. You know, we're always bouncing off each other, trying to trying to learn, trying to learn things, trying to make the best of 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 what we are as a football club. And uh, it's in a good place at the moment. But yeah, I do want to go into management. And, but I'm I'm not ready for that at this moment of time. It's interesting, like um, S- Steve Morrison's done a phenomenal job in a short space of time. But also, I think um, I think I mentioned this to you before, but even I think even more so now is I look at the people <coughs> who are behind the scenes and working with him, like yourself and Huds and um, Tom, and I can never remember his surname. So Ramson. Just, yes, that's the one. Um, Derek, every time I speak to Derek Brazil, he tells me he's one of the best coaches around. He raves about We're Ramos, yeah? Yeah. No, very good man. Very good man. We're, we're, studi- we're both, at the minute, both doing our pro licence with the FAW, so sort of we're, we're spending a bit of time with each other, sort of going through all our sort of projects and all that sort of stuff we've got to get done. But yeah, he's a very good coach, and uh, as I said, the, the, the club's in good hands at the minute. Absolutely. Be uh, very interesting. So your under twenty three season starts next week. Next it? Tuesday, Peterborough at home. It should, should have been, should have been Tuesday this week against Birmingham, but it's uh, yeah, next Tuesday. So at, at, the, at the stadium as well, we're kicking off at the stadium, which will be great midday next Tuesday. So if anybody's about and they want to come mm-hmm. and watch a game of football, we'll see how we get on. But it's um, yeah, it, it's going to be a good season. We've got it's going to be an exciting season. We've got the we've got the Premier League Cup as the as the World Cup's going on, which will be great. We're trying to get as many games on a Saturday afternoon, so the Cardiff fans that can't obviously going to be missing the, the championship football. They can get and watch a, yeah, a Cardiff City good, side yeah. over over a weekend. Uh, so we've really got the Premier League Cup over over the World Cup times, which would be good. Um, just an exciting season. We've got some really good young players within the group. I like think like Joel Colwell, Ruben's brother. He's um, he's only a second year scholar, but he's up playing with the twenty ones already. So for him, he's uh, he, he's a, he's a bright talent. People like James Kroll, Jack Leahy. There's, there's a lot of a lot of talent coming through the uh, through the twenty ones at the minute, and uh, hopefully uh, over the next uh, next six months next year there'll be a few more debuts. That's the way. That's the way. Um, <coughs> just last question. Obviously, um, are England going to qualify out of the group in the World Cup? Because they're obviously not going to finish top of the group, <laughs> are they? So it's going to be. A I've got a bet. I've got a bet with me physio about this. Yeah. <laughs> obviously, you beat us at the um, the last was the yeah, last World Cup. You finished above you. us, didn't you? So. No. Um, tough group. It is a tough group, but I think England will win it. Well, they should. They, they They've should. got more players they, to select. Don't start putting yeah, pressure yeah. on them. You know what <laughs> I mean? It is what it is. So, you know, uh, listen, I, is, are England going to win it? I very much doubt it. Have England got a chance to win it? Yeah, of course they have. Will Wales win it? I very much doubt it. But they've got a chance of getting through the group and making a. Making making a summer of it or making a winter of it out in Qatar. So it's weird, eh? it's, it's good, but I, I I go back to I, I was at the um, the Austria game. I went and watched the Austria game uh, at the Cardiff City Stadium, and when we spoke earlier about atmospheres, that was one of the best atmospheres That's I've been incredible. in. Incredible! It was unbelievable. I'm not Welsh, but I felt so. <laughs> I felt proud of you know mm-hmm. listening to the songs that were being sung and the national anthems and that. I looked at it and thought, well, fair play. It was uh, it was uh, it was decent. Yeah, it's going to be good. Um, Darren, I appreciate you coming in again, mate. It's been My a pleasure, sir. It's been a good. pleasure. I really enjoyed talking about coaching and that today. Yeah. Didn't know where it was going to go, but uh, I'm glad it went there. It went away. That was good. good. No, I appreciate it, mate. And uh, best of luck for the season. Cheers, sir. And uh, you. Oh, that's the other thing. So, like, last year, the end of 23s, obviously, they won, like, a lot of games. Would you rather... Would you rather, at the end of the season, say, I don't know, like four of the players from your squad at the start of this season now be in the first team or would you rather win the Premier League 2 is it? I'd rather four of the boys be in the first team 
I don't necessarily. Do. It's not about that. for me. You say oh, I've won. I've won the Premier League too. Mm. I'd get more pride for sitting and watching. Like I look at the game on on Tuesday night with with Jason Menyo coming onto the pitch. I look back at that and I think, do you know what? There's one that we've sort of semi got through. He's got a long way to go, you know, from where he from where he started from. But I look back at that and I, I get more pride from that than than where we are. Yeah, so I'd I'd rather see four lads go through and uh, and play. I'd love I'd rather see four lads come through, not make debuts. Four lads come through and play ten, twenty games. Yeah, than than win the league for definite. Because that, that's what I'm, that's like I said, that's what I'm here for. I'm not here for to. To, to, to win to win the leagues, it's great winning football matches. I think it's great getting the the, the young boys in used to winning matches and how to do the nit, the nitty gritty side of it, turning teams around, keeping it in the corner the last couple of minutes of a game when you're two one up. So they need to learn how to win football matches, but that's not what we're going to be defined by as an academy. We'll get defined by the number of debuts debuts we get, the number of lads we we get in and sell on the number of lads that we get and actually make, make careers and go and play 100, 200, 300 games for, for Cardiff City and I think if you look at the first team squad at the minute we ain't done a bad job over it over the last couple of years It's been very, very good Very good Right, cheers mate no worries, Appreciate pleasure. it um, Guys, check out uh, we've had Cardiff City first team coach Mark Hudson on recently and Mehmet Dalman Cardiff City chairman so I'm just running through with the, all the different <laughs> uh, people but uh, no, I appreciate it Like, subscribe all that good stuff Cheers guys